I'm going to start out this morning um, by uh, asking you if you have your Bibles to just to turn to the book of Galatians. And I've got a couple of verses for you there. And uh, we'll see how everything pans out this morning. Um, I'm going to start reading in, in just one verse here in Galatians, which says, I marvel not, or I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. That's Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul said to the church in Galatia, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And how many know or how many feel or how many think by the scriptures or from what you've heard um, that we are living in or headed toward the time that Christ has said he would return. And I know many of us do, right? And so um, it's just something I wanted to look at this morning because Paul is speaking to his church there in Galatia and he it says that he marvels. He marvels or he's a little bit surprised maybe or a little bit taken aback that so soon, so soon after they had heard of Christ and who they had accepted Christ and they were walking with Christ, it seemed that they had been turned unto another gospel. Now he says that they had been removed from him that called them into the grace of Christ. Christ. And remember what we learned about grace. That grace is the what? Unmer one, we say that it is the unmerited favor of God. Nothing we did to deserve it. Nothing we can ever do to deserve it. That God, out of his goodness, cares for us. That there's nothing that we have done. And then what I learned and that I shared with you that, that grace is the divine influence of God working in our lives. See, it wasn't without grace that that, that that divine influence that spoke to my heart some 17 years ago and called me. Without me even knowing it, I was drawn to the Lord. You know, we can pray for those children and we can pray for those grandchildren that God would draw them back in because it's such a powerful drawing. So, Paul says here, he said, you were removed from him. I'm su surprised or I marvel that you were removed from him. And looking up what that removed means, it, remains, it means that um, they, if you look it up in the Greek, it says to transfer, to exchange, or to change sides, to, to pervert, or to turn from. So he, he's saying to this people, I'm, I'm just so surprised that so soon you've turned from the grace that is in Christ unto another gospel. Unto another gospel. Another gospel. A different gospel. A gospel that has been altered. Or a gospel that sounds strange. In verse 7, if you look at verse 7, he says, then he goes on to say, which is not another. Now what does that mean? He has said, I am so surprised that you have turned so quickly to another gospel. And then he talks, Paul writes like I talk. Sometimes I say one thing and the next sentence I'm saying something else because it sounds like he's saying something else. He says you've turned or you've been removed from, from the gospel which, from, and have turned to another gospel. And then he stops and says, which is not another. And what does he mean? Which is not another, he says, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Not another, yet another. What, what that means, or, or what I'm taking from that, is we know what the gospel is, right? We're just going to put that in one great big bucket for now and say we understand what the gospel is is there we understand what the word says but when he says that they uh, turn to another gospel that means that they're taking the book 
that we live by. They're taking the gospel that we live by. And it is still the gospel, but in some way or in some instance, it's either been changed to meet a situation, okay? Changed to change, either added to or taken away. Now, we have to learn in these last days where we stand. We have to know where we stand, that we stand on the Word of God. And we cannot take the Word of God and change it to meet our situation or what we want, want it to say. And do you understand what I'm saying? There are some times that we just naturally, as humans in our flesh, can take that Word and twist it a little bit. But if a Word is twisted... Um, we have to see that we cannot do that because that is, that is what Satan wants us to do is to twist or to just change the meaning of the word in just a, uh, just a little bit. How many knows that we can take the word of God if we desire and we can fit it into our situation? We can do it for good and we can do it for bad also. I knew a man once, or I still know him, a good Christian man, and uh, married for many, 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 many years, I think like 28 years, and was having um, an affair, said that he was driving, he, you say, well, he wasn't a good Christian man then. I'm telling you, he got taken in, unaware. Oh, nobody could do that. No, I could never do that. How many, how many of you have ever done something that you said you could never do? I did. But he was driving his car and he said, Lord, if it's right and okay for me to leave my wife and, and go to this other woman, give me a sign. And his lights in his car, on the inside of his car, came on and started blinking off and on. He took that, he picked that up and said, well, that's a sign. It's okay. But we know, because the word says, that that was not of God. Right? But we can fit it to our situation. Now, that sounds, sounds kind of drastic. But I'm just saying we have to be careful. We have to be... Um, steadfast in the Lord and not to change the word to fit our pattern or our agenda. Right? Amen? Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, we can look at it in our situation, but here... Paul is saying that there's people that, that trouble you. There are some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. And they would be those that would claim to be steadfast in the Lord. They're, they're, they're going to be people that you know, perhaps uh, ministers on TV or ministers that you know, that would take and just change the message of Christ in just one little way. Peter says the word is, or that they rest the word. Not like rest, like sleep, but rest like twist, that it's twisted. And that, that, that is, is, is the work of Satan. Because you know what, really, if you're in a church this morning, if you were here in the church this morning, and, and, we, and we think of Satan, and we think of sometimes that Satan makes us feel bad. But a lot of times, if he could bring you to church this morning and make you feel good about changing the word just a little bit, that's how he penetrates into the church. He makes people feel good about a, a little more revelation that they had. How many know, like I said before, that the scriptures support that in the last days or in the latter days, it is going to be the church that is troubled. Well, not my church. Well, not this church. But the Bible says that the church is going to be troubled. Before Jesus comes back from the church, they are going to be more and more and more 
troubled in the fact that they have turned or compromised or twisted without it being obvious the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, and I, I hope I'm making sense. I just want to give you a couple examples and um, then, then, I'll, then I'll let you go. Second Peter, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you to turn there. You can, but I'm not going to ask right now. Uh, Andrew, don't put anything up on the board because I, I, I looked at these verses. Second Peter, in, in chapter 3 of Second Peter, um, he gives us an example. And you've heard this before where he says, um, well, let me, re let me just read this to you. He, in, in, in verse 3, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers wa walking if after their own lust. Now, what he's talking about, and he says, now listen, he said, these people are talking about, this is what they're saying. Well, they're saying, so you, you say that the Lord is going to return. Well, we've been hearing that for a long time. So when is, this, when is he going to return? And so they, they, were, they were making or, or, or um, saying that that word had never come true and, and believing that maybe it was not going to come true. Verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? I heard a woman say that one time when I was a child or when I was a, a young teenager and I went and I said to this woman, well, they say that Jesus will come back soon. Oh, they've been saying that ever since I was a little girl. And I thought, yeah, they probably have. See, I didn't know that much. I wasn't church, so I didn't have anything to draw on. But I picked up that opinion. Well, they've been saying that for a long time. And, and it's not happened yet. Paul says that they will, they, um, they said, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And so if you're of the world and you don't know Christ and you don't know the world, the word, and you hear that as, as from one being, that's not, you're not familiar with what the scripture says, you would think, think the same thing. And you can't blame people who don't know for saying that. But Paul says that those people twisted or rested the word, okay? Or twisted the word. Now I want you to look and see See um, what he says in uh, 2 Peter, and this is chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 1, just, to just verse 1. Look what he says. There is so much scripture in the book about the last days. So many warning about the latter days. Okay? Verse 2, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 1, but there were... There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift, swift destructions. He says there are going to be false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among who? Where are false prophets? Are they on the outside of the church? Where are false teachers? Are they on the outside of the church? No, they are among you. There shall be false prophets and false teachers, and they will be among you. They can be in and will be in your church. They may be great ministers that are on television, and, and you have to protect. It is your responsibility to protect what you know. He says they'll bring in damnable heresies. And that means that it, the heresies, you've heard that word before, that's heresy. What that means simply is that it's contrary to established doctrine. They're going to change one little thing and say this is the way. You haven't seen this before, but, you, but all of your life you've been believers, but I have 
uh, maybe a new revelation from God that this is what this means. Contrary to established do doctrine. But look here how far these people that Peter was talking about went. He says these people that are false prophets and false teachers that are among you and, the, and these heresies, what does it say? Even denying the Lord that bought them. Even denying the Lord that bought them. He bought them with his own blood. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to them? They're going to bring on themselves swift destruction. Now listen, in today's world is no different than it was in Peter's world because what we have, and especially, and I, excuse me, I'm talking with more of a lack of knowledge than I have uh, the knowledge. I don't have... Um, cable TV or satellite TV, I've got the three basic country channels, right? I wasn't too long ago, a couple years ago, well, it was more than that, wasn't it? That we had a, a satellite thing, and I called and canceled that. I was talking to this kid on the phone, and tell, he said, well, why are you canceling it? And I said, because there's nothing on there that we want to watch. And he, he said, well, what are you going to do about TV? And I said, we're going to use an antenna. He said, what? An antenna? You have an antenna? You could tell he was a young whippersnapper. And it's like, yeah, man, we've got an antenna. You know? And so I don't, I'm not able to get in the preaching channels. But I tell you, when I get preaching channels in, many times I turn them off. We have to be careful what we let, let ourselves listen to. Amen. Hey, you know what? Sometimes I have an uncle, and I dearly love him, uh, who made a comment about a big church in Dallas. Okay? He said, I love to watch that guy on TV. He makes me feel good about things. When you, when you just listen to him, he's just so up. And just so up. And he's just uh, makes you feel good. We better be careful, hadn't we? I don't know how much of Christ is talked about. Nothing wrong with feeling good. I don't get me wrong. But this man is not a believer. But he likes to watch that show that makes him feel good. We better be careful, guys. I'm sorry if I'm... If I'm um, not saying this right. These false prophets, false teachers, the ones that are changing an established doctrine just a little bit. Just a little bit. What these people did here that Paul or Peter was talking about, they denied the one who bought them. How did they deny it? I don't know. Have you ever heard, and I know you have, you know, people will talk that, that are non-believers. Well, yeah, I've heard of Jesus Christ. I believe he lived. Well, you could ask him, well, do you believe that, that, that he, he died on the cross? Well, yeah, I, I've read that, you know, and I believe that could have happened, but that doesn't really mean anything. We have to be careful when, we, when we're teaching and preaching and... and, and uh, the Word of God. And we have to be careful. Now see, I'm not in danger. But there are some that are in danger. There are some that are in danger. The young people, the people who have strayed away, that they'll be caught up in a lie. The something that sounds good to them. It, 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 it pleases our flesh. Actually, it. When uh, Paul was writing to the church in Galatia, Galatia He was addressing something when he said that they had turned to another gospel. And, it, and let, me, let me tell you, and I know you know this, it was just as simple as this. He said that the, that the gospel had been perverted. There were Jewish converts. Okay? And there were non-Jewish converts. They were all in Christ. They had all accepted Christ as their Savior. They were all believers. They were in Christ. Brought in under the grace of Christ. 
And then, just like that, some came in and said, but wait, you need to be circumcised. You need to be circumcised to be saved. Well, maybe they did. Maybe that's what they thought. Well, maybe I need to consider that. See, they were taught you're saved by grace. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ and what He did for you. But then there seemed to be some that knew a little bit more. Maybe they had a little bit more knowledge. And that's what, was, that's what Paul was fighting in that church. They were perverting the gospel. These people were saved by trust and faith in Christ Jesus alone. And he's saying circumcision will bring you nothing. It will do nothing for you. And, and these people were pulling this in. When you're a new believer or a young believer or an uneducated, and I say uneducated and I don't mean that harshly, I just mean that 17 years ago when I first got, or 18 years ago when I first got into this, I was pretty young educated. So I knew that I had made a decision from the very beginning. I found out that when I read the Word of God, that the written Word of God, out of church or in church, spoke to me. Now I learned that even before maybe I even believed. And as I, as I became a believer and I would pick up the word and read it, that I would feel something in my spirit and something in my heart. And um, so I learned that. What do you do? I, here's, where, here's where... I got three things. Maybe four. See, I'm, I'm probably not talking to any of you guys. And, and I know you guys have to leave. God bless you. I, bless you. Thank you. They have a friend of theirs that is sick and um, they're having a, a prayer and healing for their friend. I, I, I think that I'm stable mentally. <laughs> Kevin's laughing. This is my husband. You didn't meet him. Oh, no. <laughs> I... I always like it when he's here because then he's always the example. Uh -huh. So we have a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go quick here. You all look at me and you all think that that message is for somebody else. I would never be pulled away. But in our desire to serve God and to knowing more and to have more revelation, we just need to to guard. Now I stand here this morning and, and, I, and I say this critical and it's going to sound critical but I just want to ask you to ask yourself what, how much time have you spent in the Word this week? See really I'm glad that you guys know that you can trust me but how do you know that you can trust me? Because this is what we face in the last days. We will have teachers. I have teachers. See, when I don't understand the Word of God, I go to somewhere else. I, go, I, I have, I have uh, uh, commentaries. I have to look it up. I, I think, well, I don't understand that, so I need to know what that means. But the Bible is the final thing, okay? Now, if you're not in the Word... You have to be more careful. <clears throat> and I suggest, and I know we're past the days where you bring a Bible to church. I, uh, we got one here. Alan, I think he's reading a romance. <laughs> oh, it's a holy Bible. <laughs> but let me encourage you if, you, if you have a Bible, pick it up and read it. Amen. See, when I first started reading... I said to someone, to my pastor, what should I read? He said, read the, read the Gospels. And read them over and over and over and over. Yeah. And you know what? Hey, at least I was smart enough to listen to that. He said, I said, what else do I need to know? That 
is what you need to know. So I started and I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, when you take somebody that's me and I like to read, that was easy for me to do. But if you're somebody that says, well, I can't read that well, and I don't have the time, and I don't like to read, okay, do you have a Bible that you can read? If you don't have a Bible you can read, you ought to get one. You ought to get one that you can understand. But you ought to pick it up and open it up every day if you can. And see... I'm the kind of person, when I look at a great big job, it scares me, and then I don't do it at all. Like if I, if I have to wash all the walls in my house done, that's more than I can comprehend at one time. But if I would just wash one wall down and keep doing that, eventually I'd have it done. And so for if you're not one that reads a lot, you should still open up the book get in there, pick you out a couple verses, think about them, and go on. Because how else are you going to know when someone is lying to you? And if you can get those four Gospels into you, you'll be all right. You'll make it. Because that is the Gospel. That is the Gospel. Everything else is, all of the Old Testament is leading up to what Jesus did. And everything after that, the Gospel tells us what he did. And then everything else after that, except for Revelation, tells us what it meant. What we don't understand about what he did. Know your scripture. 2 Peter 3.2. I'm going to kind of flip around here a little bit. It says to be mindful. See, you need to know your scriptures. You need to know them. You need to learn them, or you need to know what ground you stand on. You say, well, I, I'm not a good reader. I can't understand it. Okay. Then you find somebody that, that can explain it to you. There's been a lot of things I didn't understand in the early years that I didn't understand. I, said, I don't understand what this means. Tell me what it means. Someone that knows and someone that you can trust. It doesn't have to be your pastor. It can be a friend. See, I can go to Alan. I could go to Alan. It seems ironic sometimes when I sit up here and I see Alan on the back row. And 17 years ago, I thought Alan just knew so much about the Lord. I just did. He had a relationship that I wanted. I love that this morning, that song that you sang. And did you hear old Alan Beller in there back behind you? I think he knew every word of it. Um, but... There are people in our lives that when we don't know, we can, we can surely find someone we can ask. You could ask me, and I'll tell you what, if I don't know, I'll find out. I'll find out. 2 Peter 3, 2 says, That ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by who? By the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Listen, he said we are to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. We are to be mindful of the word. This is what I'm saying, and I feel like maybe I'm talking to somebody that doesn't need to hear it, but maybe, maybe somebody will. In the last days, there's going to be battle for the word of God. That's going to be Satan's major battle. If he can fill up the churches with people who say, well, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ lived. Yes, I believe that he died on a cross, but I don't know that, that what he did bought forgiveness of sins for me. If he can get him to believe that, you know what? He wins. He wins. We think that he, that he may... Uh, uh. Okay, be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. That's your word. Get a Bible, read the gospel, read about the goodness of God, and also the judgment that is extended in those four gospels. Because see, this is what I found out when I first started reading. And I knew nothing, 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 nothing. I didn't go to church when I was a kid. I only knew enough about the Bible to use it against somebody else. I went and got me one to use against my brother. 
I worked with some people many, many, many years ago that at Franklin Electric, I worked with this, this girl, and she was a churchy girl. And so there's a couple times she made some comments to me about the way I was. And you know what? All right, I went and got me a Bible. And I found that in there where it says, Judge not, so that ye should not be judged. With, without, with what judgment ye meet out to others will be meted back to you. I memorized that. I was so proud of myself, and I just waited. <laughs> Worked and waited day after day until she made a comment about me. And then I blasted her with it. Shut her right up. I didn't know what I was saying. But when I started reading the gospel, I will tell you this without anybody telling me what I should think or what I should feel by reading those four gospels. I began to feel what that God loved us. That Jesus Christ loved us. That's what it said to me. If I could sum it all up that he loved us. That he loved me. And that he wasn't harsh. But there was also, I understood there was a judgment. I understand that without reading a commentary. I understood it without going to the pastor. I understood it without turning the TV on and saying, uh, well, what uh, uh, this Tom, Dick, or Harry had to say about the whole, whole thing. Just by reading that, God speaking the word into my heart, into my mind, into my spirit, I understood at least two things. God is good. Jesus Christ, His Son, is gentle. He's loving. But there is a judgment that comes from those who don't make a decision for Him. I understood that. We have to be mindful of what the Word says. Keep in memory 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. This is Paul. says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand, go to verse 3, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. Okay, what does that mean? He says, unless you believed in vain. Keep in memory. Get the, get the word, and then keep it in your memory. Because there are some, do you ever, am I the only one that has to talk to myself sometimes? Sometimes I have to take the word of God and repeat it back to myself. I remember, maybe I don't know it word for word, maybe I don't know where it came from, but I knew what God meant, and sometimes I have to talk to myself. He says you have to keep in memory what you have read and the word that has went into you and the word that I preached to you, because if you don't, you are in danger of believing in vain. And he says <clears throat> this. See, he, just as Paul was talking to a certain situation in Galatians about them twisting the word and saying you need to be circumcised to be saved, Paul here had in this church, in the church at Corinth, he had a problem with these people saying there's no resurrection of the dead. You call yourself a Christian, you're in church, you believe in Christ, you've got all of this that he's done, but then somehow... Some way, the word got twisted. Somebody come in and made a comment and says, you're not thinking right. Or, or they were pulling old beliefs that they had before Christ came back in and, he, and they were saying there's no resurrection of the dead. And so he says you have to keep, keep in memory what the word says. Because somebody is perverting the word. Listen to what he says in... Um, Verse 3, did I do that? Okay, put up verse 3. Okay, Paul says, now here's your, here's your, here's your basic. Basic 101, what you've got to stand on. This is, Paul says, well, I, what I delivered to you and which I received, how that Christ died for our sin, what? According to the Scriptures. According to the scriptures, Paul always goes back to the scriptures. Number one, he's saying, remember this. Remember what the scriptures said. Stand on this. Christ died 
for our sins according to the scriptures. So that when you're faced someday, when you're all alone, and someone says to you, no, no, I don't believe that Christ died for our sins. You can go home, pull out your book, open it up, and you can hear the words of Jesus saying, no, I died for your sins. Verse 4 says he was buried. See, Paul's talking to them people that said there was no resurrection. He was buried and that he rose again the third day. What? According to the Scriptures. Thank you, Kevin. According to the Scriptures. See, I... I, I we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, do we? See, we don't know. Them when you're hurting, when you got something to go through, when you think you're all alone in the world, and you think no one understands, whatever it is that you're going through, you can get out of this book at home, in your closet, in your living room, without having to call anybody, it's here for us. The promises that he made. See, he just had this one little problem. They were all Christians. See, the new Christians, the ones, the Gentiles, they probably didn't have a problem with that. But the Jews that were converted to Christianity, they had a problem with it. And there were some, remember the Sadducees, that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they're going to these people, these new converts, saying, but there is no, there is no resurrection. Listen to what Paul says. I'm not there. I won't read it. He says, if you believe that Christ did not rise from the dead, then your faith is in vain. It's in vain. Go to the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? I want, to, want you to turn to Luke 24. And I've got a couple things because when I was a new Christian, I liked to read those writings in red. I still do. Because that means that's what Jesus said. You see, when I read the, the words that he said, those words are for me. They don't pertain to the church at Corinth. They don't pertain to the church in Galatia. They don't pertain to the situation that happened then. They pertain to me. The Gospel of Luke Chapter 24, verse 44. This is what the Lord said. And he, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you when I... He's talking to his disciples. And by the way, this is at the very end of Luke. So this is after Jesus was crucified and rose again and appeared to his disciples then he is reminding them. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. See, here's what he told his disciples. Look at the word. Look at the word. Go back to the scriptures. Go back to the holy scriptures because they will tell you about me. He said, "These those things were written in, were, which were written into the law of Moses. See, he's telling his disciples, listen, these things had to be filled, fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Well, there's some reading you could do. He's telling his people, go back and read and remember those things were written. And look at verse 45. I like this too. Then, then it says, 
Opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now we need to pray and when we pick up our word and say, Lord, just help me understand this. Because there's sometimes that I have read and read and read and read something that I didn't understand. A, a long time ago, I can tell you that um, a few years ago I was reading in Ezekiel. And the thing is, and, and you can say, well, maybe you shouldn't do this, but you know what I do because, hey, God's smarter than I am. And, but I, I think it was Ezekiel 37 or 34. I think it was chapter 34. Anyway, here's, here's the short, the long story made short. Six months. Seven months. Every time I opened up my Bible at night, it opened up that chapter. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I say, well, God... You know, is there something I should read here? Sometimes I feel like there's not. At the same place, and so I read it. Guess what? King James Version, I didn't understand it. So I read it. The whole chapter. Then the next time, I read it again. Wasn't every night. Wasn't the only time. There I am right there. Okay, I'll read this. And then it just went on and on. And finally I said... Lord, help me understand this. It, you, I keep going back here and reading this over and over and over and over again. And I don't understand why you want me to read it. I'm reading it, but I really don't understand what it means. Will you just give me some wisdom here? Help me to understand what, what this means. I don't know. I'd be driving to work or somewhere and all of a sudden it, it just this understanding. Not of the whole chapter. This is what I mean by this verse. This is what I mean. Oh, the shepherds aren't feeding the flock. You know, they feed themselves and they're getting fat. That's talking about the preachers. They're getting fat, but they're dirtying up everything else. And I understood then, verse by verse by verse. And, and that's what you have to put the Word of God in before you can do that. Listen, he says, he uh, said he opened their eyes. So uh, ask for understanding. Ask for understanding. Just do that. Sometimes, I, I mean, I have to do it because I just, it didn't come naturally to me that they might understand the scriptures. Verse 46, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That word behooved means it was in their best interest. See, I had a boss, and, and, and I am, I am, I'm getting ready. I'm not going to keep you much longer. Listen, I had a boss several years ago, and she was the big boss. I mean, like she was the big kahuna. You didn't want to mess with her. I found that out because I messed with her a couple times, and it, wasn't, it didn't behoove me to mess. And I thought, she used that word all the time. It really doesn't behoove you to do that. And I thought, yes, in my best interest. It's not in your best interest. This says, and he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. You know what? When it behooved Christ to suffer, that would mean, Kevin, it was in your best interest. It was in your, at least that's the way I, I think of it. I don't look at it. It is, was in your best interest. It was mine. Yes. That he suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. See, Christ was Christ. Christ was Christ. But he rose, well, we've talked about this, when he rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples and he appeared to those 500 and he appeared to this one and this one and this one, that would, it behooved them that he appeared to them because then they had that, they, they seen him, they knew. He had proved to them that he rose from the dead. But see this step one, step two, step three, there's your gospel, there's the truth that you got to stand on. It's in the scriptures. And even Jesus told them. He's not saying. He, he, didn't, he didn't say. Yeah, other times he did. But in this instance, he's not saying, just believe me because I say so. He's saying, believe me because that's what the scriptures have said. Look back and you will see the, what the scriptures have said. He said, so it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. And 24, 47 says, what? And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. That's your gospel. That's what churches need to be preaching. That's what, but you wouldn't come if that's all I preached every week. But maybe if you didn't come and I preached that out every week, the church would be full, huh? 
that's our basic standing that the gospel is preached. Jesus, I come to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the sick and make the lame to walk. But I come to preach the gospel, the good news, that Jesus Christ, and we just went over that, came, that he uh, sacrificed his life for us, that we can receive forgiveness of sins, and that, that it should be preached. We have to guard what we've received in the scriptures and what he's taught us. Twenty four forty nine. Jesus said, And I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye are endued with power from on high. That's verse 49. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye are endued with power from on high. He might say to me, and I'm going to send the promise of my Father, but you go home and you wait because I'm going to send that and you're going to be endued, the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be endued with power from the high. You know what the word endued means? I love this part. This helped me. You may not like it, but when you look up the word endued, it means clothed, and it means that, that it fits like a glove. See, the Holy Spirit fits like a glove. The Holy Spirit fits you like a glove. And how many know, or how many, if you think about that, if you just put that in your mind, that when I was seven, 17 or 18 years ago, when the Holy Spirit began to move on me, number one, that He even gave me the ability to believe in the first place, that He draw, drew me in, that I was able to believe, that I wanted to read the Word, that I was able to believe it, and then my life, my life, my life. But you know what? He flits us like a glove. He's not, He fits you, Kevin. He fits you. He knows you. How important are your gloves to you? They're pretty stinking important, aren't they? He works outside in the winter. He's got Raynaud's disease and his fingertips are cold. They turn white. He has no circulation in him. I don't know how many times this year he come in. And he, he's such a pain sometimes. Just look at these gloves. And it's like, you know, Kevin, I've looked at these gloves twice a week now for two months. Now I want you to look at these gloves. These are the best gloves I ever had. These, man, feel how soft they are. It's like, yeah, Kevin, I've done this. You know, I just, like a little kid, I just, okay, okay, I'm going to feel your gloves. Put them on. <laughs> Would you put them on? Okay. Now bend your fingers and your thumb. Don't them feel good? That's how the Holy Spirit is with us. See, He's not going to put the same thing on you that He's put on me. And He's not going to put the same thing on Kevin that He's put on Alan. He puts on what will fit us. And, and Brother Eddie back there, you know what he said last night? And uh, I love Eddie. And I, I know you've been sleeping, man, but I'm ready to close. See, Eddie has been healed by God. And he says, I just feel like I need to pray for people. You know why? He's got that glove on him. He knows. And yes, Eddie, when people are sick, he says, when people are sick... And there was a nurse he had. She had asthma. And since he prayed for her, she's not had one asthma attack. Because see, he's been there. He's been endued by the Holy Spirit It's to, to reach out. Oh, I don't know. Uh-oh. Somebody is in big trouble. In Galatians.
Paul said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, but though we or any angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then, then what we have preached, let him be accursed. Verse 9 repeats the same thing over just what he said. That tells you how important it is. As we said before, verse 9, So say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than what we have received, let him be accursed. You know what? You don't be among him. You don't let him among you got people that start coming and, and, and having heresies or saying things against the scriptures. You know to be them against the scriptures, we need to confront that. We don't want them. We don't want that infiltrating our church, right? I would rather this church stay just like it is right here this morning and not have every seat filled than to have people coming in that was going to put the word of God and jeopardize the word of God because we don't want that. We want to stay strong. Galatians 1, chapter, or, chapter 1, verse 4. Paul, again, just goes back to the basics. Go back to the basics. He says, who gave himself, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and the Father. He gave himself for our sins. That's what you have to remember. You all know that, but that's what you got to stand on. Okay, then to conclude, just quick, you got to know your scriptures. you got to know them. you got to pick them up. You have to. You have to because there ain't always going to be somebody else around doing it for you. Get you a Bible, and if you don't understand it, get something that you can read. And if you're blind and you're old, get big print. And if you can't afford one and you can't get one, I'll buy you one. Come and talk to me. Now, don't all of you come after church and say, I need a new Bible, so I'm just going to go get one right now. And if you don't understand it, you know what? Some of the new versions help you understand it a little bit. Kind of put it more into a modern day language. Know the word and know that you've learned today, if you didn't already know, that the word can be compromised. That's what I wanted you to learn today. The word of God can be compromised. If it's going to be compromised, it's going to be compromised by church people in the church. It's going to be something that you turn on, you're going to turn on the TV, and you're going to hear some whamby bamby pastor that says, well... I'm just going to make you feel good. Isn't God good? Isn't he good? You know, and he's not addressing the th that, those things that you have to stand on. He's not pe teaching people how to stand on anything. He's only teaching people how to feel good. Amen? You've got to look for wisdom. You've got to seek understanding and ask for that. Ask God, make me understand what this says. Because the bottom line is, you and you alone are the one responsible for standing. Ephesians says what? Stand therefore. Stand therefore. Stand. And having done all to stand, and how are you going to stand in the evil day if you're not able to pick up in your mind two or three basic things that Christ did it all for me, there's nothing I can do, and I'm going to stand on that. No matter what else the rest of the world says, I'm standing on it. I believe that he died for me. I believe that my sins are forgiven. I believe that when he said at the cross, it is finished, that it was finished. That's what I believe because the devil's going to come along and say, no, you need to get circumcised, man. You need to go over here and buy this book and read that book. Or you need to go through that. Uh, 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 you need to read that book and do what that book says. Because then, then if you do that, then you'll understand. Do this 40-day thing. Do this. Do that. Do this. Do that. And you, and you can say, and you'll be able to say, no, uh-uh. I'm standing on the Word of God. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand what He did. And I asked, and, and, and as I'm closing, listen, I asked Brother Andrew to pre play a song, that make, and then and when the song is over, you can be dismissed, okay? Listen to this song. I thought of that, this song on the way to work this morning. Eddie, I don't know if you've ever heard this song, but you've got to listen to it. Because i got to tell you, now wait just a minute, Andrew. 
Have you started it? No, that's not me. That's the cell phone. Okay. Um, listen, when, this song is an old song by the Gaithers, I think. I know. And I can remember the first... See, when I started coming to church, a wise man who was Brother Allen, ha, ha, he said, you, you need to get you some Christian music. So I did. I went out and got them. I can remember, oh gosh, how hard I thought everything was. And I heard this one time, Andrew. And that's where we all are today. It's called, I can't even stand without you holding my hand. Brother Allen, how many years have you been a Christian? He don't even know how old he is, friends. But as long as he can remember, he's been one. Brother Allen is no different than it was 20 years ago or 30 or 40. Today, you're not even able to stand without him. Listen to the words of sent. Brother Andrew, thank you for all you do, Brother Andrew. Go ahead and play this. Pastor Troy, you want to dismiss us, please? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we know that you said your word would not return void. So, Father, we expect something good 
is just about to happen. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have here this morning to preach the true gospel. Our Father, lead us and guide us and direct us this week. Keep your hand of mercy upon us. Let thy Holy Spirit shield us. And Father, we know that you will take us through. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.